Hey y'all, my name is Martin Malalu and I'm a librarian with LA County Library, as well as the head of the LA County Library Pride Committee. Thanks for joining us today for our program, Trailblazers in Conversation. Before we get going, I wanna tell you a little bit about the library and the Pride Committee. Established in 1912, LA County Library has 86 library locations, as well as a number of maker mobiles, bookmobiles, early literacy outreach vehicles. We serve 3.4 million residents over 3,000 square miles. We provide a plethora of services and materials from ebooks and audiobooks to online language learning programs, live virtual tutoring, story times, puppet shows, art activities, cooking workshops, and so much more. You can learn about what else we offer as well as programs we have coming up from our website, lacountylibrary.org, or from any of our social media sites. LA County Library also hosts a Pride Committee. The Pride Committee is a group of library workers who create content that engages and educates the public on issues, ideas, and histories directly relating to the queer community. We prepare activity ideas to help you learn about queer pioneers, we host author panels and poetry writing events, and we curate book lists to assist you in finding your next gay read. We're constantly putting out new content, including this program, to tend to the needs of the queer community and interested allies. Check out our page at lacountylibrary.org slash pride. We have some fun stuff planned for this evening to help us celebrate LGBTQ plus history month. We'll be starting off by answering the question, what is LGBTQ plus history month? Once we've learned a little bit about why we recognize the accomplishments of queer pioneers, we'll be taking a tour of the West Hollywood Library, which houses our LGBTQ plus collection. While materials by and about queer people are available at all of our library locations, West Hollywood holds a special collection that's worth a visit. Next, we'll introduce LA County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl and Library Director Sky Patrick. Sky will lead the interview as we listen to Supervisor Kuehl share details of her journey from closeted actress to openly lesbian politician. We'll field audience questions after the interview. Please remember, the focus of this conversation is on Supervisor Kuehl's life experiences, and we have only a limited time for questions. If your question does not get answered or you have another question for Supervisor Kuehl, we will post contact information in the chat. Thanks for joining us tonight, and with that, I'll hand it over to Kay Wantuck for a brief overview of LGBTQ plus History Month. Hi, my name is Kay, and I'm a librarian and Pride Committee member for the LA County Library. Today, I'd like to talk to you about LGBTQ plus History Month. In 1994, Missouri public school teacher Rodney Wilson began promoting October as LGBTQ plus History Month after he wrestled with his own coming out. He stated that LGBT history gave me self-confidence as a gay person and strengthened my resolve to live as best I could an honest, open and integrated life. He came out to his classes during a lesson about the Holocaust, and then it evolved into a national mission to teach young people about LGBTQ history in the classroom. Wilson's vision was inspired by the many different History Month celebrations he taught in school, and he later worked with many national organizations to create a diverse and comprehensive curriculum for educators about LGBTQ history. This month-long celebration takes part in October, in order to coincide with National Coming Out Day on October 11th. In October, we also commemorate the National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights of 1979 and 1987. It was important for Wilson to recognize LBGTQ plus History Month during a time when children in the United States are typically at school. This is in order for it to be integrated into the school curriculum. LGBTQ plus History Month is now celebrated in seven different countries. LGBTQ plus history is plentiful here in LA County. It's especially prevalent here in West Hollywood, where I come to you today from the West Hollywood Library. New York City and Stonewall Bar are often the first places that come to mind when we think about historical fights for LBGTQ plus rights. But Los Angeles County was also at the forefront of many of those fights. Just 10 minutes from us, one of the first modern day queer uprisings occurred at Cooper's Donuts in May of 1959. During the 1950s, different local, state, and federal laws made it illegal for people's gender presentations to differ from the sex marker on their IDs. 
These laws were seen as flexible by the police and could include anyone the police perceived as queer, if the police decided they were acting strangely at all. That night at Cooper's, two police officers arrested five queer people and tried to force all five into a police car. Onlookers from the gay bars surrounding Cooper's found this unacceptable. They began throwing trash, coffee, and donuts at the police until they abandoned their arrests and drove away without arresting anyone. Only six miles from the West Hollywood Library was Black Cat Tavern. On New Year's Eve in 1966, police led a large and violent raid on Black Cat Tavern, arresting many LBGTQ patrons. Shortly after, on February 11th, 1967, a protest was held by the Personal Rights in Defense and Education Group, also known as Pride, that was attended by over 200 queer people and their supporters. The demonstration was met by armed police officers. This makes the tavern the site of one of the first demonstrations by LGBTQ people, protesting inequalities and abuse by police and local governments. This preceded the Stonewall Uprising by two years. Remember, anytime you walk around Los Angeles County or check out a book here at the West Hollywood Library, you are surrounded by queer history. If you would like to find out more, visit your local library. Thank you. Now we're gonna hand it off to David, who will tell you more about the wonders of the West Hollywood Library. Welcome to West Hollywood Library. Come on in. My name is David Davis. I'm one of the librarians here at West Hollywood Library and a member of the Pride Committee. Let me take you on a quick tour of our fabulous library. West Hollywood Library is one of the libraries located in the third supervisorial district that has recently reopened for in-person service. West Hollywood Library has a space for children to read, learn, and play. We also have an amazing children's theater modeled after a theater in Michelangelo's Laurentian Medici Library in Florence, Italy. It's where we hold our story times. Our teen area is where teens can study and hang out. Then we have rotating art exhibits and artwork, all for your viewing pleasure. We've got it all. Views, workspaces, computers, study rooms, free Wi-Fi, a new playground, and a terrific staff always happy to help you. And we have something no other LA County Library has. The library's LGBT and HIV collection, both of which are among the largest public library collections of their kind. This is a growing collection which includes popular and academic materials, out of print and hard to find titles, LGBT classics, current bestsellers, and new Lambda Literary Award winners and nominees. We're proud of this collection. It showcases LGBTQ plus history. Be sure to check the collection out when you visit us. And don't forget to visit us at lacountylibrary.org slash pride to see all the library's LGBTQ plus resources. Check out our upcoming LGBTQ plus programming, new releases, book lists, information about our LGBTQ plus databases, and activity ideas such as making your own queer vision board. We also offer a learning pathway for LGBTQ plus history in Los Angeles, as well as a list of our queer websites in organizations for additional resources. If you have an LA County Library card, you can enjoy from home the library's LGBTQ plus databases, one archives at USC Libraries, Archives and Down, and the Archives of Sexuality and Gender. These three databases contain thousands of pieces of primary source material covering LGBTQ plus history and include manuscripts, newspaper articles, photographs, ephemera, letters, and more. There's a treasure trove of history to be found in these databases. For instance, here we have a photo from the 1967 protests in support of the Black Cat Cabin in Silver Lake. So take a walk down Queer Memory Lane with these databases and visit us at lacountylibrary.org slash pride and enjoy LGBTQ plus history month. 
We hope you visit us at West Hollywood Library. Come over for the friendly service and stay for the views. See you soon. Hi, my name is Kay Wantuck, and I'm a librarian for the LA County Library, and I use she, her pronouns. I would like to introduce our trailblazer today, Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. Los Angeles County enjoys a strong and vibrant LGBTQ plus community, which includes a passionate, which includes passionate advocates and allies. We are thrilled to have with us today one such ally, Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. Supervisor Kuehl has been a longtime LGBTQ ally who has worked diligently over the years for LGBTQ rights, even when doing so was politically risky. A former child television star, you may remember her days on the many lives of Dobby Gillis. Supervisor Kuehl went on to graduate from Harvard Law School in 1978 and worked as a public interest attorney before moving on to serve six years in the California State Assembly, where she became the first woman in California history to be named Speaker Pro, Pro Tempore of the Assembly and eight years into the California State Senate. For both chambers, Supervisor Kuehl was the first openly gay or lesbian person to be elected to the California legislature. Supervisor Kuehl has been a champion for women, families, people with disabilities, and the LGBTQ plus community, advocating on a number of issues, including healthcare, education, and discrimination. In November 2014, Supervisor Kuehl was elected to the LA County Board of Supervisors. Her accomplishments are numerous and include increasing the LA, County, LA County's minimum wage, providing funding and services for people experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity, increasing services and support for foster children and their caregivers, developing a women and girls initiative to bring needed changes and programs in all county departments and services, helping county departments focus on better services and support for LGBTQ youth, advocating for environmental preservation, water conservation and green power, protecting our arts venues and productions, and then with that, I'll hand this off to David Davis to introduce our library director, Sky Patrick. I can't tell leadership roles at Broward County Library, Queens Public Library, and San Francisco Public Library. <clears throat> Patrick manages the library's $201 million annual budget and is responsible for the operation of its 86 locations in 18 vehicle mobile fleet serving 3.4 million residents in a 3,000 square mile area. <clears throat> Patrick is committed to breaking down barriers and access for all. She introduced the ICOWN Equity Initiative, which ensures that library services and programs address the needs of the diverse communities served throughout Los Angeles County. When COVID-19 forced the library to close in March 2020, Patrick led staff to establish new services to reach beyond library walls, including laptop and hotspot loans, Park and Connect outdoor Wi-Fi service, and virtual programs for all ages and interests. As library director, Patrick continues to reinforce the library's role in the community as a civic and cultural center, a hub for public information and services, and an institution of literacy, innovation, and lifelong learning. Patrick was appointed to the executive board of the Urban Libraries Council in July 2017. In January 2019, Patrick was named Librarian of the Year by Library Journal one of the most established industry publications. Under her leadership, the library has also won the Library Journal 2018 Marketer of the Year Award and 2019 Library of the Year Award, in addition to being named a finalist for the Institute of Museum and Library Services National Medal in 2018 and 2019. In 2020, Patrick accepted Innovate at UCLA's Community Impact Award and was selected for the Durfee Foundation Stanton Fellowship, for which she is currently exploring 
how 21st century libraries can be transformed to address the social, educational, creative, and cultural needs of the Los Angeles County residents. So, Sky Patrick, you have the floor now. Thank you, David. What a great introduction. Um, I always hope that I can live up to the, that uh, introduction. Supervisor Kuehl, welcome. Librarian Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to have this uh, incredible honor of interviewing you. Uh, there's so much I feel like I know about you from reading, but uh, some of these questions, I think we'll be able to hear new things about you uh, and get your perspective. And just um, for a point of business, I do have a couple of dogs in the house. I hope that they don't start barking, but if they do, I'll turn myself off. <laughs> I'll put myself on mute. Sky, I, I, you have a couple of dogs in the house? I thought lesbians only had cats. What are we talking about here? I have one of those too. <laughs> well, I'm relieved. I'm so relieved. Yes, we uh, we have a full zoo over here. <laughs> okay, so uh, these questions were um, fielded by our staff. I want to take an opportunity to thank Martin and Kay and David for putting this together. They were obviously very integral in getting uh, you and I on the same platform at the same time. It's not easy. So, uh, without further ado, I'll get right into our questions. So, we're going to start uh, our questioning with some of the LBG LBGTQ issues. Um, obviously, it is LBGTQ uh, History Month, and it provides an opportunity for us all to reflect on how on how the lived experience of queer people have changed. Reflecting on your own experience, why do you think it's important that the LA County uh, uh, chooses to celebrate this history month? Well, I think uh, we know that unless you know your history, you're not going to be able to ref reflect on what uh, has been important and what has led to what. And so as a part of the larger history of humanity, it's incredibly important to think about our uh, group because we, uh, we've suffered a different kind of discrimination and oppression from other minority groups. Uh, and it's important to learn from others and that others can learn from us. Uh, I really didn't have, I know you're going to ask, but I didn't really have access to a lot of information about uh, the accomplishments of people who were queer, about how many people I knew, you know, who were queer. We were all in the closet. It was a very difficult time, but I think that understanding where we've come from and how far we've come um, is very important to the straight world and I think to the queer world as well. Examples for people who are uh, dealing with their own sexuality and worried about it maybe, don't know what a huge and wonderful family they're actually a part of and joining, but also the larger world. I mean, I happen to be there the night that Rob Eichberg and Gene O'Leary decided there should be a national coming out day. And the whole notion was, unlike you, Sky, for instance, uh, it's very difficult to say, um, I, I knew my daughter was queer or whatever, because I knew my daughter was black. That, that part is gonna be obvious. But we had to think of other ways to tell people that third grade teacher that taught you so much, that nurse that saved your life in the hospital, um, these people are LGBTQ people, it's just important for you to know and kind of take out your prejudice and explore it a little bit. So history helps with that. It tells us who has led, who has gone ahead of us. It also tells us the low times for our community, how people dealt with that, how our allies were there for us and led the way in many ways. Um, and that's why I think uh, a month isn't long enough <laughs> for all of it. Uh, I might be in agreement with that. Uh, I, I think you said that uh, very well. There's a lot to this, this history and this community uh, that we could 
frankly, spend several months on and still not really cover the breadth of the work that's been done and the struggle that has been had. So you did kind of launch into uh, my second question, but just to kind of expand on that, um, I understand that you didn't have a lot of people to look up to or any role models, but do you, do you recall any what we would call pioneers or mentors, whether they be LBGTQ or not, was there anybody like that in your life? Well, I certainly had mentors when I was in college at UCLA. Um, the, uh, the man who ran the university religious conference that sponsored Unicamp and I was a counselor at Unicamp, um, taught me really more than I've learned from anyone else about leading with the heart about how that can be so empowering to you and to other people about how praise uh, can, you know, help children sort of light up in a day and think better of themselves. I learned a lot from him. Um, there was also a, a man who was a Presbyterian minister at UCLA, um, Don Hartsock. Um, the first man's name was Luke Fishburn. I want to give him credit and Hartsog. The first time I met him, I think I was 16 when I started college and I went to visit because I was counseling at camp and I went into the building and he had books scattered all over the floor and he was reordering them in some order that made sense to him. It wasn't alphabetical. I can tell you. And I said, have you read all these books? You know, that's what you want to say to somebody like you look at their bookshelf and he said, oh, yeah, at least once. And that's how I became who I am. Um, and I thought, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to read as many books as I possibly can. But in terms of queer mentors or queer um, examples, no, I really didn't have any because there were some, but I didn't know they were gay. And, and for a long time, I didn't know I was gay, you know, so it was a real struggle to get through and a lot of fear, uh, a lot of worry and um, I think unnecessary if you can connect with the community and just know your history. That's fantastic. I think that, you know, in your next life, maybe you'll come back as the county librarian. <laughs> it seems to be somewhat appropriate. <laughs> My honor. <laughs> <laughs> with your uh, amazing and illustrious bookshelf behind you. I always want to see what you're reading and what's behind you. You have well, one of the best collections I've ever seen. Well, sometimes Scott, oh, this is just the beginning of it. I mean, there's rooms, oh, yeah. you know, um, but sometimes I stack up the books depending on the interview that I'm doing. So a book that's the biography of Maurice Kite. I'll talk about him later. Talk about history in LA. Uh, Maurice Kite was the founder of the center and it was in 1969, very, very early in the uh, county. And it was the gay community services center. So it wasn't just, it wasn't about advocacy. It was about feeding our community, about getting them off the streets, about helping them when they got in trouble with the law, about helping them love themselves and protecting them from the police who were very oppressive. And he started it in his apartment. I mean, it was just like people would gather and that was the first, you know, LGBTQ center on it was just gay. And then when they got their place on Highland, uh, it said gay community services center. Uh, some of the dykes showed up one night and painted a little, you know, uh, carrot gay mm -hmm. and lesbian community services center. Um, and so, you know, the history goes from there, but I'll talk a little more about that later. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love what you said about uh, praise being able to light up a child and what a difference that makes early on, whether you're LGBTQ or not, the difference that that makes to have someone in your corner being your cheerleader. So uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, speaking of young people, um, do you have any advice for LGBTQ people who want to be involved and get involved with politics? Um, and I think maybe a second and possibly a tangential question would be, um, do, what do you wish you had heard um, as a young politician um, as you made your way up to your uh, fabulous position today? So a two part question. Well, let me correct the uh, phraseology. I was never a young politician. Except when I was, you know, on my council at high school, um, 
although people did remind me, I always was on council at high school, college, and law school. I always thought, oh, I never thought about running for office, but it's true. It's a whole different thing. I was 53 when I first ran for office, 53. Uh, and I ran, um, partly I got two really good signs about running. One was there was a huge earthquake in uh, 1994. And um, I opened up the times to read uh, with all the broken glass from my paintings falling off the wall and everything. And it said that Terry Friedman, who was my assembly member, decided he wasn't gonna run again. And the filing deadline was February 9th for anyone that wanted to run. Well, February 9th is my birthday. So I thought, ooh, that's a good sign. You know? <laughs> and then when I signed up to run and everything and they printed the ballot, the ballot, my ballot number was 53, which was my age. So I thought, can't lose, you know. Um, but I would give LGBTQ people, young, median, and old, the same advice about running for office. You should not run for office if the reason you're running for office is because you want to be in office. Okay, that's just bogus. You need to have something that drives you, that you want to do, that you want to accomplish, not just for yourself. And you also need to have something you've done. I mean, imagine your life as a brochure that you're going to show to somebody saying, you know, here's who I am, vote for me. There ought to be something you can put on it. So you don't start your life running for office. You start your life doing something. It can mm -hmm. be a job. It can be a volunteer thing if you're working uh, to <clears throat> house the homeless. Uh, there's a young woman I met the other night who is still in high school. She started a nonprofit for drag queens who are out of work. She decided that they were very vulnerable, very poor, and that's what she wanted to do. And I thought, boy, that's going to, uh, now there's a resume, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, talk about doing something and it's important. So my advice is you have to be something before you run for office, not something famous, just something that you can say, here's who I am. Here's who I'm, what I'm about. And, and I want to run because I, and it should be something realistic, not like, you know, you're running for, I don't know, Miss America and you're for world peace. No, it's not that. Something real. What do you want to do? Uh, can be environmental. I mean, Greta, you just watch her going, boy, she knows what she's about. And and that's, and half the world would vote for her for something, you know. Um, Karen Bass is running for mayor of L.A. And everybody's going, oh, thank God, you know. I mean, she's so fabulous. So um, it's about what you do that's not about yourself. That's right. Uh, what I wish I had heard when I was running, there was just nobody that could tell me whether I was going to be able to, whether I was going to suffer because I was queer or whether that would completely make it impossible to be elected or whether people would resonate to an experience if it seemed it was more broad than just being queer. Uh, not getting a job because of it, because I lost my TV series when they found out I was queer. Whether that would resonate to people, but it's not just the victimhood or the suffering, it's also realizing how important it is to have all kinds of different people engaged in every kind of endeavor so that we understand that we're serving, you know, everybody in the county or everybody in the state or everybody and not leaving anybody out. Mm. Um, I wish there had been somebody to help me know that I could get there. But fortunately, because I was in my 50s, I was already fully developed and very confident. And the people said, uh, we know you're gay. Okay, we know you're gay. But what are you going to do about education? You know, right. they didn't care the most thing about the the fact that I was gay. They want to know what are you what are you going to do to solve the problems? And that's what you need to concentrate on. And so like just walking back to stepping back into the 50s, uh you're you being 50, I think you're getting closer to 80. So almost I 30 years ago. I beg your pardon? 
I am 80. You are 80. So yeah. 30 years ago, so it's really changed. Um, I, I would argue, say arguably even 40 years ago, it would have been about you being queer. Um, and whatever your politics or your angle would have been, could have been drowned out by the fact that you were queer, as, it, as you mentioned here about losing your TV show. Well, interestingly enough, the community was kind of angry at me because I didn't put lesbian on every one of my brochures. As though that was the most important aspect of me, mm -hmm. um, though it was important, but people magazine saved me from that because my, my character on Dobie Gillis was very popular. We were in the top 10, uh, when the show was on in the sixties. So every time I made a change in my life, people magazine would write about it. You know, yeah. if I went to law school or I became a law professor, and certainly when I was running, so they did a big article called Zelda leaps out of the closet and runs for office. Um, so I didn't need to come out to anybody. <laughs> and because 50 billion people read it. So I just said, okay, that's done. I don't need to you know, take a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, uh, they did that. <laughs> now I can talk about education, you know. That's right. <laughs> Well, fortunately, it turned out well for you. Obviously, you know, it doesn't always uh, turn out well. You know, you mentioned losing your TV show and I think and, and I'm certain I read something about you uh, being in a sorority at some point and being uh, ostracized, if not asked to leave because they thought you were uh, gay or queer. So um, that kind of leads me into my next question about uh, the impact of uh, being queer and your career choices. Do you think you would have continued acting if that were an option for you? Or do you think that you eventually took the path that you wanted to take? Or was this sort of a byproduct of you uh, uh, losing your first career? Did you ever see that movie, Sliding Doors? It was really about a woman who either caught a, a subway or missed the subway. And her life, if she caught the subway, and her life, if she missed the subway. And I often think, because my mother was a fatalist, although my father thought, no, you make your own life. So, you know, I'm a combination. I often think things happen as they're supposed to, and I do believe in my guardian angel. So sometimes when you go through something really hard, you don't know that there might be something better on the other side of it, better than you would have had if you hadn't gone through this hard thing. So um, there was a, a discovery at my sorority of letters that uh, my lover and I had written each other that I kept. And um, so I was kicked out of my sorority at UCLA. Um, and I don't know really what the knowledge was uh, about my career, but when I did a pilot for my own series as a spinoff from Dobie Gillis, everybody was very excited about it. But the president of CBS, Jim Aubrey, when he saw it, said, she's just too butch, we can't do this, unquote. And so when my director from Dobie Gillis took me for a walk around the block and told me that, I just broke out in a cold sweat because I thought, oh my God, it's all over. And indeed, the, my career just didn't go anywhere after that. But as it turned out, it allowed me to go to law school and change everything in my life so much for the better. Because look at all the child actors who were their contemporaries of mine and how rough their lives have been. They didn't find anything else to do. They weren't, you know, it's kind of funny the way fate takes you. So I think I would never be the person I was had I not been discriminated against. I don't know whether that makes any sense to the audience because discrimination is a terrible thing, but it sometimes you have to pick yourself up, reckon mm -hmm. with it and go in another direction. And it was a good direction for me. And it was your resiliency, right? So one door closes and maybe two more open. Yeah. And, and it's not, like, I'm not saying that people who suffer aren't really suffering and and I did too. I was, you know, I contemplated killing myself like so many in our community. Um, I, um, it's real. 
it's just that sometimes, as I'm saying, your life takes you in a different direction and you just don't know it's going to turn out better. That's right. It's unfolding right before you and hopefully we'll, you'll be able to see it. And so I think I speak for everybody on this, on, on this webcast. We're glad that you, we're glad that you stayed. I'm glad that you're here. Me too. <laughs> so. Um, that does kind of bring me to another question, just again, a little more tangential here. Um, how do you feel, and you've talked to me about this before, and I would love you to share with the audience, with the audience, how do you feel being an actress has helped you as a politician? <laughs> I bet you everybody's laughing now because they know the answer to that. Um, and that is, uh, oh, she can say things that she doesn't really mean. But that is actually the wrong answer. And I want to go back to what it is to be an actress. Mm -hmm. When you're an actor, you are not doing anything phony. You are reaching deep inside yourself to feel what your character is feeling based on your own experience. Deep sadness, great love, um, humor, whatever it is. And just like when I watched Jane Fonda make a speech, and I started watching her making speeches back during the Vietnam War, um, she is so open. She uses her body, she uses her voice, not in a funny way, to be able to show everything she's feeling. And for a, I won't say politician, I would say for an elected. Politician, you're running for office. Elected, you have a whole, bigger responsibility. You make a lot of statements, you make a lot of speeches, you argue for what you think should be right. Uh, I really recommend that your audience see um, uh, Political Animals, which is a film that was made about f the four lesbians that served in Sacramento. We were the first queer people in the legislature. And what we went through in speaking on the floor and what we took in a bunch of crap you know, aimed at us that were other people speaking on the floor. And it really helps you to be able, even now, when I am trying to say to people, this is really important. The fact that you can use your body and use your voice, that's really what your training is as an actor. And it's being more real, not being unreal. So it's very helpful, I think, in any public work, um, because people can see you know, she really believes that. I mean, she's, I can see she's sincere. Um, and that's helpful. It just helps you fully use yourself to say what it is you think needs to happen. I love that. I've never quite heard that explanation, but that really resonates with me. I, I like how that sounds and just like giving yourself over, whether it be what, what, whether it be in acting or becoming the person or really taking charge and, and putting yourself out there, your physical self, your emotional self, and with your beliefs. Love it. Um, it's very vulnerable. Sorry, you say know, that again? It's very vulnerable and people yes. appreciate that you're kind of risking a little bit in showing so much, just like in any relationship. And, you know, as a politician or an elected, I have a relationship with my constituents, with my colleagues, with the people whom I supervise, like your fabulous self. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's just, it's important to be able to say and show really what you, what you mean. As, as the kids say, uh, you know, keeping it real or yeah. being a realist. Uh, I, I think people really, they, they want that. We all want that. We want to know that we're talking to someone real and that we're being heard and listened to. So thank you for that. You know, that brings me to my next question. Um, and you started to touch on it a little bit. Maybe you can just uh, share a little bit more here about what are some of maybe one of the biggest challenges you've faced at being uh, a supervisor for LA County, all of we, we all know it's the largest county uh, in California and arguably uh, the United States, at least by populace. The greatest challenges I think are, um, the, this county is as big as every, bigger than any state in the United States, except for seven. So bigger than, you know, 43 states. 
Um, but we do all of the things that states do. Uh, states make laws and budgets and we carry them out. Mental health, you know, health, public health, for Lord's sake, we've seen that in the past year and a half. Yes, uh, you know, libraries, parks, animal shelters, um, all the various kinds of medical facilities. We have hospitals, we have clinics. Uh, we are in charge of 32,000 foster kids, the biggest uh, child welfare system in the United States, and we have responsibility for them. Um, incarceration or not, which is what we're trying to do now. Yes. Uh, homelessness and uh, how you can move upstream and stop homelessness you know, before people become homeless. All of these are the biggest challenges in being a supervisor. It's like being five people being the governor of Ohio. And it only takes two other people to pass something. It's very convenient. Um, but it is, people ask me, how do you decide what a policy should be? And much of it is from your own sense of what is right, but also what needs to be done. I believe that everyone should have a place to live. I don't believe that everyone is just going to have a place to live magically. Somebody has to do something to help with that. I believe that everyone should have good mental health. Everyone doesn't. It's not going to happen by magic. So we have to put in place actual processes by which people can help themselves and be helped into a better life. Mm. It's, it's frightening. It keeps you up at night. I mean, it really does. And you want to talk about the challenges. The challenges are there are 10 million people in this county. I mean, how do I get everybody to get vaccinated? How is it they don't know they're putting themselves at risk? I don't care what they call freedom. It, it's, it's just necessary to protect your health. But I have to try and convince people one at a time. Each of them is afraid or worried for a different reason. So it's going to where people are. That's a challenge as well. I imagine you don't sleep much given what keeps you up at night. Um, Actually, I do sleep a lot, but sometimes it's a nap. I've learned. The, the, uh, <laughs> I'm going I'm to have to take your playbook on that. I have not learned it, but you know, the idea that you have 10 million people that you are responsible for. 2.2 million specifically, but 10 million collectively, 10 million plus. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how is it to work for LA County? And it's like, there's no place like it. There's no other place that you can work, no other jurisdiction that you could work in that has the size and scope of Los Angeles County. So that's how it is to work here. And I think you just demonstrated it. Um, a couple of questions about the library. I uh, would be remiss in not giving a few library questions. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to hear from you is how do you feel that the library and the LBGTQ plus community can align ourselves to be better partners in civic participation? Clearly, this is one of those ways, just again, socializing uh, a supervisor. Um, outside of the board, uh, but what are some ideas that you have that we can better improve uh, our engagement? Now, do you mean the LGBTQ community being served by the library, or do you mean being involved themselves and the library being involved in what in a civic discourse and whatever? Sure. I mean the latter, um, but we you can certainly address the the first as well if you'd like. Um, I don't know why I just got some kind of sign about connecting with something, but I'm still connected to you, right? <laughs> um, We're still here. I, th I think the LGBT community has um, a special ability because when you've been an outsider, you are more disengaged, or let me say less engaged with the rules. They yeah. haven't worked for you. You're not going to slavishly follow them, we hope. Um, and so, in a sense, when people say, oh, your community is so creative, well, it's because we're allowed to be creative because we had to find workarounds. We had to That's find right. lives that we invented for ourselves. We had to make up our own families sometimes when we were kicked out, and that happened a lot. 
we have been inventive. And I think that that is a great deal of what we have to contribute, which is to say, color outside the lines. And especially now that we see different gender identities, we are really coloring outside the lines, which is why we put T in all of those letters. And there's more even than LGBTQ, as you know. Um, it is a special talent of ours and one that we, I think, don't know that we have. And that is to say, I, there's another way to do this. And there's a fun way to do this. And there's an outrageous way to do this. And, you know, when the men and the women weren't talking to each other before AIDS, right. the men were frivolous and party animals. And we were all organizing in the women's movement and we were very serious and wearing flannel shirts. And when, <laughs> we, had, when we had to come together because of AIDS, we were losing right. guys. They needed us to kind of move in and help and nurse and help we suddenly had a more of a sense of humor and they suddenly were better at political organizing and that i think is how this movement really came together because of a terrible epidemic um and we learned so much from each other and i think the combination of it made us very powerful and i think that's a great deal of what we have to contribute to the civic dialogue. Um, in terms of libraries, there is no better place. I don't know how it works now, because when you say to somebody, how are you going to find out that fact? They pick up their phone and they, you know, Google, it's a verb and other things. So I think the library has a special place of helping people find the right thing because you are on your own when you go on Google and you don't know what comes up at the top is there because of an algorithm, not because it's the right thing or not even because it's true. That is absolutely correct. Libraries have much more integrity than Google. There is no question. And also, I'm old fashioned. I like to hold a book. I like to read a book. I like there to be books, nothing against electronic books, but I started out as a little kid going to the library and I decided I wanted to read all the books in the library. And I would start with this shelf. It happened to be fairy tales. Does that tell you something? <laughs> of course I read the red fairy tale book and the blue fairy tale book and the green fairy tale book which is full of ogres and things. I mean, it was really kind of scary, right. but I just read and read and read and read and read and read and read. And it was like going into a new world, especially since I started reading science fiction when I was, I think seven or eight. Oh, wow. Science fiction is the best social critique ever invented. I just saw Dune the other night and that is still the best selling science fiction book in the history of the world. And there's a reason. Even Star Wars, when you know the people when they were writing it, they were like taking notes from Dune. Um, because it allows you to imagine a world where there's something not familiar and it teaches you something. That's right. The hegemony, for instance, of religion. That's what Dune had in it. It wasn't just about, it was so about politics and power, but it was also about the power of religion to make people do things. And I had not thought about that as a kid. Um, and it could go on and on and on. I mean, every book you've read is like that. Um, and I, it, it, it could be any of the books that we're reading now. You know, it's uh, you bring me, you remind me of the quote, and I believe it's from Neil Gammon and my, my illustrious staff will correct me, but I think he quote his quote is something like uh, Google the Google will bring you back a thousand answers, but a librarian will bring you back the right one. Uh huh. So and I think that's true. Remember in the old days, I don't know about you, but if you wanted to know something in the middle of the night, because you were all 
I won't say smoking, never mind, uh, smoking real cigarettes, real, honestly. And yeah. go, no, it wasn't. It was so and so. And we didn't have, you know, even cell phones then. We would call the library and say, I've got a bet, you know, was so and so the star of such and such. And the librarian would look it up for you and tell you. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And so thousands of calls in the middle of the night. That's right. And so, you know, we do have some of that still today, uh, but we don't necessarily rely on the Google, although I'm sure I'm sure some staff uses it, but we leverage databases, accurate information through databases. So we, we're still working in that capacity, but it's sometimes it's a little bit different, like a better, a, maybe a more um, relevant question today is, where can I sleep tonight? I don't have a, I don't have any place to sleep. Where can I get in at five o'clock? That might be a more realistic sort of like um, question that would come to our staff. Um, I also had a, 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 just another quick question. By the way, I did change out of my flannel uh, <laughs> in order to uh, do this literally five minutes before. Cool anyway, Sky, come on. <laughs> um, how's it going? Uh, reading all the books in the library. Have you achieved that yet? Nope. Okay. The damnedest thing, Sky. They keep coming out with new books. I know. I, know. Well, I can't. I just. I can't keep up. I, I well. I no. I can't keep up. Yeah. I. I get it. I get it. Um. So you know, speaking about books, I love that you still read regular books, paper books. I am um, agnostic. I read both paper books, and of course, I do a lot of digital because I'm always on the go. Uh, but I love when I hear people say, listen, I just want the book. I want to feel the paper. I want to smell the paper. I want a dog ear and write in it. Not a library book, of course. We wouldn't advocate anybody doing that. But I do write in my personal books and dog ear them. Um, so speaking of that, you know, uh, what LBGTQ books did you wish were around when you were coming out? And again, I understand that you came out later, but what's been a critical reading point for you that you're like, oh man, I wish I, I wish I knew that earlier, or I wish I read that earlier. Is there anything like that? No. You know, it's it's just interesting. I mean, there are uh, mystery book series with uh, heroines, uh, mostly heroines uh, who are lesbians and some heroes who are gay. Um, it's really different now, though, because there are so many of us in so many art forms. We have the ability to see ourselves on television. And I wish that there had been that ability. I wish that the books that I had read in the old days, if there was a lesbian in it, didn't have the required suicide at the end of it. If she was a lesbian, she had to kill herself, you know, by the end of the book. Um, and I, I honestly didn't find, um, and I am not the best person because there's everybody watching will know better than I what their book might be. But the things that have inspired me, and again, I'm telling you, I'm a science fiction um, aficionado. Um, I think a, a book about a planet where there are three sexes in order to make a kid. That was so important to me because it made me think everything we do in twos, everything's supposed to be twos and heterosexual. It's just, why is that? It's because of our biology. We didn't invent it or make it good it's simply that's the way humans are but if we weren't humans we might think three was the magic number and you know that kind of imagination uh where uh in another book for instance you would uh the the members of that lived on a planet would change their gender um and uh, you know the the men the males would bear children because they would, that would be their job that particular time, but they didn't stay necessarily. It was gender fluidity, didn't have the word. So those books were really important to me and I, and they were around. That's the interesting thing, is that they were not joined in anybody's mind to what was possible here because they were 
simply critiquing gender. They weren't saying you you will be safe in the world if you come out. That's, uh, yeah. And then, you know, you read, oh, Billy Jean King, oh, people that I know are gay, and that's really important. And little by little, it kind of soaks in. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that you um, bring up that uh, the the science fiction for one. So when you were talking about science fiction earlier, I of course went immediately to my favorite, who is Octavia Butler, and uh, and I and I think it's the Wild Seed book. I'm not remembering which one, but the character changes gender, uh, and it's not a thing. It's not no. a thing. It, it's 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 only even sort of relevant to the storyline in that. It's ever, gender is ever evolving. So it's interesting that we're at this time now where this more fluidity and, and, you know, this, this, uh, idea of claiming one's pronoun. I mean, I think you're right. Science fiction has written about this for decades now, and we're seeing it come to fruition. And I certainly saw that in the uh, parable series of Octavia Butler. They are. Oh, I think fiction for me, I don't read nonfiction. I feel like people are preaching at me when I, they're, they're writing nonfiction. I, and it's wonderful. I'm so happy Adam Schiff's book is number one this week. But I, I just like reading fiction. It teaches me more. That's where I learned the politics of making gender a hierarchy, you know, where it's like Ursula K. Le Guin, who was a great science fiction. Just gonna say that it was in the chat. You know that the uh, that the the nurturing words are same and different because you learn about each other. The killing words, she says, are better and worse. So the the lesson she taught was: it's fine to be all these different things, but why say one is better than the other? That's where they'll kill you. And that I learned from Ursula K. Le Guin. And so in the chat, I don't know if you can see it. One of our, one of our, uh, our uh, participants mentioned Ursula's work. Of course, uh, everyone is so excited. They're done listening to me talk. They want to ask you a couple of questions. I could go on and on. I literally have another page of worth of questions. I will spare you. I and have to uh, sign off at 520. Have I to. Understand. That's why we got to get to their questions. Okay, good. Uh, we have uh, one of our staff members aggregating them. Oh, they, there they are. This is uh, Martin. Are you going to read the questions, Martin? I am going to read the questions. Perfect. I'll turn my camera off. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I could listen to both of you talk about gender and sexuality in literature forever. Um, but uh, we do have some questions. Um, so somebody asked, of all, so you reached a pivotal career shift. Um, so out of all the things you could have done, why law school? Wait, say again, reached a, a pivotal career so, shift, what? Yeah, so why did you choose law school? Um, I was an associate dean of students at UCLA. After I lost my TV career, I went to work, went back to UCLA where I'd taken my BA. And I was hired in the student kind of uh, the, the, the office that advised student organizations. But when was I hired? In the late 60s. Okay, so the organizations I was given to advise were the SDS, the Progressive Labor Party, the Women's Liberation Front, the Black Student Union, MECHA. Okay, they weren't interested in having a lot of advice, but they gave me advice. And what they said was, hey, you're smart. We're going, one of us is going to law school to learn the tools of the man. They're never going to let you be chancellor here. You ought to go to law school. So it was my students that essentially said to me, you ought to go to law school. So I only applied to UCLA. They turned me down because I had a 2-9 overall. And that was not a high enough grade average. But when I graduated in 62, I graduated with honors with a 2-9 overall. Why? Because during the Sputnik time, they didn't give A's. You had to really, they gave one A in a class. They gave like five B's and the rest of us all got C's, you know, no matter how good we were. So a two nine over, overall was really high. But when I applied to law school, it was like in the bottom 10%. However, Harvard had a different way of looking at applications 
And so when my guardian angel showed up on campus, I'm telling you, it was my guardian angel and said, you ought to apply to some other schools. And I did. And he said, and send this study that I've made about grade inflation at UCLA during the Vietnam War. Because if you flunked out, you were sent to war. So everybody raised their grades one level. And my 2.9 was then worth 3.8. And he had a study to show it. So I sent that and Harvard said, sure, y'all come. So I, my joke is UCLA turned me down, so I had to go to Harvard. <laughs> That's very cool. Um, I, thank you for sharing. Uh, we have another question. What do you want to do after politics? Do you have any plans after this? I am retiring next year. I am 80 okay. years old. I've been working since I'm seven years old because I did a series before Dovie Gillis in the 50s. Um, and I'm really looking forward. You know, it's funny. I see my life as a sort of an arc or I don't know what they I guess they would call full circle. I was a poet. I was an actor. I was using my right brain as a young person. Went to law school and it's all pretty much been left brain since then. I want to get back to that. I want to write my autobiography. Um, I read a wonderful biography of an actor named Lyle Talbot written by his daughter. And he happened to coincide with the whole 20th century in terms of his career. And so she used it as an opportunity to tell the history of entertainment in America through his life. And I'm thinking, oh, that's how I want to write my autobiography. Where am I in each you know, decade in America? How are things changing? Because the first TV series I did was the first film television series and everything changed for the studios. Um, I want to write poetry again, but I also want to travel. A lot of my friends are going to kick the bucket before I see them again. I don't want that to happen. So I want to spend a month in the Bay Area. I want to spend a month in San Diego, New York. You know, I have to see them all again. So I guess the short version would be, I'd like to wake up in the morning and say, what do I feel like doing today? And that is just not possible in this job. <laughs> That doesn't sound very much like a retirement to write an autobiography. <laughs> That's because you don't understand retirement. <laughs> retirement is waking up in the morning and saying, what do I feel like doing today? It's very nice. Uh, so this wouldn't be a library program if we didn't ask you what's your favorite book and why? Um, Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. I've read it 27 times. And I usually read it, I was reading it every summer, the, the whole trilogy. At, at the minute I get to the last word, I want to start over again. I just think it is such a perfect book. But the reason I think it's perfect, or three books, is because of the quest being undertaken, not really voluntarily exactly, but kind of, by an ordinary hobbit who is called upon to act in an extraordinary way against extraordinary odds and against real evil. You can see why it would appeal to me. I grew up near the Coliseum in LA. My parents were not poor, working class, you know. Um, until I started acting, I felt pretty ordinary. And even after that, uh, I just feel like it's so extraordinary that this person had to decide, okay, this came to me, this ring, I, I have to do this. And it's kind of like he says, okay, I have to do it. And then of course, I mean, not, not to mention Sam Gamgee, you know, the great friend of Frodo who goes with him. Talk about a friend. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to Mordor. Sure. Why, why not? We'll probably die along the way, but Hey, um, I don't know. I love the trilogy. That's my favorite. Um, got a few more. Uh, what are some books or other media you would recommend we read to better understand our communities? Well, I think I think everybody knows their own answers to that at the moment. They've probably been able to find so many things. What I want to really recommend is reading everything you can find about the incredible part that LA has played 
in LGBTQ history in this country because New York gets a lot of press, but LA was actually where it was happening. Read about the donut shop downtown where uh, the drag queens threw donuts at the cops way before Stonewall. And you know, you already heard a little bit at the beginning about uh, some of the clubs, but read about the brothers, two lesbians who had a bar on Central Avenue called the Brothers and dressed to match. Uh, read about, uh, you know, anybody that wrote anything. That's why I put Morris Kite's uh, biography up here, because Morris, as I said, was one of the founders of the Gay and Lesbian Center, a fabulous man, a great dreamer. Who knows Morris Kite? I'm hoping that everybody's writing in the chat. Oh, me. I knew him. I knew him. I've heard of him. I know who he is. But L.A. is such an, I, I am a chauvinist. Okay. I grew up here. But our place in LGBTQ history is amazing. And I think that's what I would tell people. Find everything you can about LGBTQ history in LA, in the black community, in the Latino community, in the Asian community, in uh, certainly in the women's community. I mean, Tori Osborne, who was the head of the Gay and Lesbian Center, the first woman to do that, uh, was deeply engaged in women's music. Do you guys know about women's music? Have you read? Do you know Margie Adams? Do you know, you know, Chris? Do you know all of them? Uh, Holly Near should listen to every album Holly Near ever made. Why? Because that was music they wouldn't play on the radio because the pronouns were all wrong. And it's important to really know how art is uh, so entwined in our history. But, you know, and LA is an art center. What can I say? But we were very much where it was at way before Stonewall. Absolutely. And I think that uh, to plug the West Hollywood Library again, that's a good place to kind of check out their collection and what they have on the history of uh, the queer movement in LA. Um, we might have time for one more. Um, are there any uh, LGBTQ plus related organizations you want to tell tell us about uh, that are having events this month or any events related to the history month that you know about that you want to you know there's too many and everybody would shoot me if i just named you know one or two um so no but again one of the great things about the universal tool is that we can find everything that's happening now you don't know whether it's you know a, a great thing but you can make up your mind for yourself just like every day you get an email telling you where you can get discount tickets to stuff, you know? Um, I, I, I'm sure, I, you know, we're not having as many festivals as we were before COVID, obviously. Uh, so many times they may be online and seem like, you know, less fun, but more safe. I mean, we've, our community has learned how important it is to be alive and to stay alive and to guard our health and to take care of each other. So um, I, I think a lot more virtual events over the next several months. Sorry, I'm not going to highlight just one. That's totally fine. Uh, totally understandable. Uh, I think uh, that's it. So yeah, I'm going to uh, just wrap up by saying, sorry, Martine, didn't mean to interrupt you. I want to thank you again, Supervisor Kuehl, for coming and talking to us here at the library. Uh, maybe just one last thought I'll leave the audience with your, your uh, comment about, you know, the time in which gay men and lesbian women came together during an epidemic. Well, the world has come together now during a pandemic. So I look forward to seeing what we become after this moment in time. So thank you so much for joining us. We My pleasure. You. Take care of each other because at any given time, some community is suffering. We've got to be with them. Thank you so much. Thanks to both of you and to everybody uh, who joined us today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Take thank care. You. Thank you both. Thank you everyone for being here today. Don't forget to check out our website. Uh, there's a couple of links in the chat uh, that We'll take you there. Um, there's also a link to Political Animals, the canopy movie that was referenced tonight. Uh, so check those out and uh, thank you for joining us. Happy Instream Month.